Believe it or not, one of the featured attractions at Taboo Tuesday 2005 was set to be Steve Austin's first official match in a WWE ring in almost three years. Booked against Jonathan Coachman of all people, at the pay-per-view where fans could shape the card with their votes, it was almost a foregone conclusion that Austin would be walking away with his hand raised after a straightforward, one-sided mud hole stomping in San Diego. But that is not what ended up happening with the so-called toughest SOB in WWE failing to fulfill his apparent obligation. And while some cried that Austin had left the company high and dry as he had done in the past, the actual backstory as to why the match fell apart is, in fact, much more complex and interesting. And if you want me to tell you more about it, give me a hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm Jack from Cultaholic Wrestling, and this is the true story of the WWE Taboo Tuesday 2005 debacle. The final days in the full-time in-ring career of Stone Cold Steve Austin are pretty well documented. He was beat up and burned out and frustrated with the creative team, harboring a general disdain for the direction of not only his character, but of the WWE product more broadly. And this indirectly led to his decision to, as they say, take his ball and go home after being presented with a scenario where he would lose a King of the Ring qualifying match to Brock Lesnar on the June 10th, 2002 episode of Monday Night Raw. After that much publicized professional dispute, the Texas Rattlesnake returned to the ring after an eight-month absence to first defeat Eric Bischoff at No Way Out 2003 and then put over The Rock in his squared circle swan song at WrestleMania 19. From there, Austin accepted a gig as the co-general manager of Monday Night Raw, which then morphed into him becoming the sheriff of WWE's flagship show. This lasted for close to a year when further issues arose between Austin and Vince McMahon shortly after Stone Cold served as the special guest referee for the calamitous send-off match for both Brock Lesnar and Bill Goldberg at WrestleMania 20. Austin appeared on the following two episodes of Raw, in segments with Rene Dupree and Shelton Benjamin, before having a backstage meeting with Vince and his good friend slash talent relations head Jim Ross at the April 6, 2004 SmackDown taping in San Antonio, Texas, with the most pressing issue being the negotiation of Austin's new contract. The sticking points for Austin were going from a full-time TV character to a part-time one in order to explore outside opportunities in film and TV, as well as securing the rights to use the Stone Cold moniker in relation to projects outside of WWE's control. But just 10 days after the meeting, however, negotiations broke down and all projects were taken off the table after the two sides came to an impasse over intellectual property rights. WWE blamed the breakdown on the lawyer representing Austin, although the star himself was unwilling to accept an offer that prevented him from making his own deals. McMahon was reportedly fine with Austin making some of his own deals, but not those in areas that he considered competition with WWE business. The two left their meeting in San Antonio on April 16th, knowing that the door was open to do business together in the future. While there was intermittent chatter of Austin doing a match or a series of matches with other organizations in Japan, including a potential pay-per-view bout with his good friend Goldberg, it seemed inevitable that WWE and Stone Cold would be back working in harmony sooner rather than later. On January 9th, 2005, Austin and McMahon held a press conference to announce that Austin had signed a three-picture deal for lead roles in WWE Studios film production. Productions. With that announcement, it was natural to suspect that Austin would also begin to reappear on WWE TV. The company smartly saved his televised return for WrestleMania 21 when he appeared as a guest on Piper's Pit in a segment that ended with him giving stunners to both Carlito and Hot Rod. From there, Austin did a little bit of this and a little bit of that, appearing every now and then in the odd segment on Raw. He was also notably present at the first ECW One Night Stand pay-per-view, showing up unexpectedly to give Eric Bischoff a stunner before leading the show close. Beer bash. The next time Austin appeared on WWE TV was also a special occasion. This time, advertised in advance, he was one of a plethora of stars returning for Raw Homecoming. In a long and occasionally quite funny segment, Austin interrupted Vince McMahon and gave him the inevitable stunner. Then Shane McMahon came out and got the same treatment, followed by Stephanie before finally Linda got dropped in quite possibly the worst Stone Cold stunner cell in the history of wrestling, until WrestleMania 38 at least. The segment was the ratings peak of the show, drawing a 5.0 rating or around 6 million viewers. Backstage afterwards, Vince was shown threatening to fire somebody for what had happened to his family. 
And it didn't take long for heads to roll, as Vince came out to seek his revenge in storyline on the next week's episode of Raw. According to Vince's logic, he didn't blame Austin for the attack on his family, and he didn't blame Eric Bischoff either. He blamed the fans. But since he couldn't exactly fire the fans, he turned his attention to the announced team, who he said had sat back and watched them get stunned one by one without lifting a finger to help. Jonathan Coachman instantly apologized in heelish, weasel-like fashion. Jerry Lawler gave a more dignified apology that allowed him to keep face. Jim Ross, meanwhile, told Vince that he was sorry his wife got stunned. Then Stephanie came out, to which JR told her he was sorry her mama got stunned, as JR would say. But then Linda herself emerged and turned heel by telling JR that he was fired before giving him a swift kick to the nuts to end the show. But rather than just a piece of televised entertainment, there was in fact more to JR's on-air firing than first met the eye. You see, Vince and his right-hand man in television production, Kevin Dunn, had wanted to replace Jim for a while. In their eyes, the Oklahoman was too old, too out of shape, too Southern, and a bit too pro-wrestling for their tastes. And, as sad as it is to say, they also apparently had issues with the facial paralysis that was the result of JR's bouts with Bell's palsy. So they fielded an offer, reportedly a three-year deal worth around $500,000 a year to UFC commentator Mike Goldberg. Now Goldberg, who knew nothing about modern wrestling but was a fan as a kid, contemplated the offer but ultimately decided against taking it after Dana White agreed to bump up his pay. There was also some speculation that Vince wanted Goldberg to no-show a UFC pay-per-view before showing up on Raw, while former WWE writer Cord Bauer later mentioned that Stephanie McMahon wanted him to change his name because they already had one Goldberg. In any case, with Mike Goldberg out, the decision was to go with Coachman and Lawler. The October 17th, 2005 episode of Raw began with Vince showing a highlight reel of all the times JR had been humiliated inside a WWE ring. Many, many times, lest we forget. Before formally introducing the coach, wearing JR's trademark black cowboy hat as his new replacement. Later in the show, Austin showed up and had a verbal showdown with Stephanie McMahon. Once the off-color jokes were done with, Steph made a match for Taboo Tuesday, Austin versus Coachman, with the stipulation that if Austin won, Ross would get his job back on Raw. However, if Stone Cold lost, he would be fired. The three potential stipulations fans could vote for were, ready, uh, a verbal debate, an arm wrestling match, and a street fight. Stone Cold finished off the segment by threatening Coachman and filling his hat with beer before dumping it on his head. A day later, JR underwent surgery to remove part of his colon in Oklahoma. The then 53-year-old had been in pain for a while and had known that he needed the surgery for a couple of weeks, leading some to speculate that his on-air firing had been done as an excuse to remove him from television while he convalesced. But the evidence seemed to suggest that the timing was more coincidental and that the relationship between JR and Vince McMahon had deteriorated of late, with the chairman legitimately wanting him out of the picture, at least as an on-air character, for good. Speaking of being out of the picture, Steve Austin didn't appear on the October 24th fourth edition of Raw, with Stephanie, the coach, and Mick Foley, wearing a JR t-shirt, continuing the angle instead. Vince was also on that episode of Raw, appearing in one of the company's low points, as far as the history of WWE television is concerned, the infamous Dr. Heine segment. Vince, as Dr. Heine, and accompanied by nurse slobber knockers, performed colon surgery on a Jim Ross dummy. He pulled out a bottle of barbecue sauce, a football, an owl, Mae Young's other hand, a goldfish in a plastic bag, an Oklahoma football helmet, a Steve Austin cup and for the punchline jr's own head because he, he's implying that he had his head up his own eye you yep you get it all of this was soundtracked to audio of jr making some of his famously passionate announce calls and the segment ended with vince sorry dr heine throwing the nurse onto the table while jr was laid up in hospital and recovering from let's be clear a, a serious medical procedure vince and evidently some others on his creative team felt that this was a very funny thing to put on the air the whole dr heine farce would have at least made a tiny bit of sense had it led to Austin beating Coachman at Taboo Tuesday, with JR then re-emerging on the next episode of Raw to finally kick Vince in the nuts as a payoff, or, you know, something to that effect. But that wasn't going to happen, especially with Steve Austin pulling out of their scheduled match. On the October 31st edition of Raw, Vince McMahon announced that Austin had sustained an injury and wouldn't be there tonight or at the pay-per-view the night after. Openly questioning the legitimacy of the alleged injury, Vince then declared Coachman as the de facto winner of the match via forfeit. He then booked a match between the number 
number one announcer on Raw and the number one announcer on SmackDown, Funaki, who was beaten down by the coach and Goldust, who had returned earlier in the segment. Coach then challenged anyone else from the SmackDown roster to a match at Taboo Tuesday, and his new opponent emerged as World Heavyweight Champion Batista. However, the animal was subsequently beaten down by Coach, Goldust, and a returning Vader, who took an age to get into the ring and then unfortunately fell on his backside while getting out. This was quite obviously a cobbled together plan B that didn't quite work, but WWE were in a bind and bringing in Batista as a substitute at least meant they were replacing the bionic redneck with someone else who had legitimate star power as well. According to reports, Austin had been told the planned finish of the Taboo Tuesday match on October 29th, just four days before the show. And this finish would apparently see Coachman beat Austin thanks to outside interference from Goldust, Vader, and a returning from injury Mark Henry. Austin, who often points out that he's always been happy to do business, i.e. lose matches, when it makes sense, naturally questioned doing a job in his first match in two and a half years on what was basically a B pay-per-view to an announcer, no less, and failing in his quest to get the beloved JR back on the air. Austin did tell McMahon that he had suffered a back injury while moving heavy furniture. He claimed he had tripped and put his back out, inflaming his sciatic nerve. But those who had been in communication with Austin around that time made it abundantly clear that he wasn't doing the match due to the suggested creative. WWE had really booked themselves into a corner because Vince had no intention of bringing JR back and beating Austin would potentially dilute his future drawing power. As far as how Austin felt about WWE's treatment of JR at the time, he obviously didn't like it and told people close to him that he wasn't too hot on the televised product in general. In short, this whole thing was a mess and added to several other messes that were going on backstage in WWE at the time. Let's take a look at a couple of examples, such as Christian giving his notice that he was not going to re-sign with the company on October 30th. Or how about the example of Edge suffering a partially torn pectoral on the October 17th edition of Raw? Even though WWE were advertising the Rated R Superstar for Taboo Tuesday, there was no way he was going to be cleared to team with Chris Masters against Matt Hardy and Rey Mysterio. And indeed, he ended up being replaced by Gene Snitsky on the night of the pay-per-view. As for Coachman versus Batista in a match that the fans obviously voted to be a street fight, well, that was pretty much a glorified handicap match, with the champion fending off Goldust and Vader with relative ease and then defeating the announcer with a Batista bomb in 4 minutes and 22 seconds. With the JR gets his job back stipulation off the table, WWE were, of course, more than happy for Batista to go over the coach. When the smoke had cleared and everyone had moved on with their lives, it was said that the relationship between Austin and WWE was back to normal. And those within the company were willing to accept that Austin did have a legitimately injured back and wouldn't have been at his best had he shown up at Taboo Tuesday. However, they also conceded that the real reason he didn't wrestle at the pay-per-view was primarily because of the planned outcome of the match. In 2021, Coachman himself commented on the situation during a Q&A session with adfreeshows.com, ascertaining that the match didn't happen because Austin felt as though doing it was beneath him. The next time WWE fans would see both Austin and JR would be on the March 18th, 2006 episode of Saturday Night's Main Event, with WWE loading up the first iteration of that particular show since October 1992. Austin was on hand to have a beer drinking contest with JBL, while Jim Ross took his rightful place at ringside to call the Shane McMahon vs. Shawn Michaels Street Fight main event. Vince announced JR's impending return on television ahead of time, reasoning that he simply wanted him to be there. Oh, okay, so the guy that you had your wife kick in the balls and then fire him and then dedicate almost 10 minutes of TV time to mocking his recent surgery. That guy, that's the guy you want back on the headset. Okay, Vince. Anyway, fans were, of course, happy to see JR and Austin, who also inducted Bret Hart into the WWE Hall of Fame the night before WrestleMania 22, back into the fold. Despite all the animosity and, quite frankly, baffling creative decisions, the two men would continue to be a presence on WWE television going forward, with Ross even taking back his full-time gig as lead Raw announcer from Joey Styles. Austin, on the other hand, would drop in every now and again when the occasion called for it, such as inducting JR into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2007. The fall of 2005, was clearly a bit of a weird time in WWE, and the Taboo Tuesday debacle and the events surrounding it didn't exactly make anyone involved look particularly good. But looking back, it's clear that the whole thing was merely a blip on the radar for two of the industry's all-time greats and remains just a curious footnote from their legendary careers. And that really is the bottom line.